Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, dear friends of the Monaco Blue Initiative, welcome back to this third and final session for the 12th edition of the Monaco Blue Initiative. My name is Jeannie Godula. I'm so happy to be here with you once again in the beautiful conference room of Monaco's Oceanographic Museum. Just un petit mot pour ceux qui viennent nous joindre et qui voudraient une traduction en français. If you need French translation, we have that for you on the Zoom, une traduction en français sur Zoom. Pour choisir le français, il faut d'abord cliquer sur le petit globe dans le bar d'outils. Puis, il faut ensuite sélectionner « Couper l'audio original » afin de bien entendre la traduction. I was just telling everyone that if they want to get translation, they can get it on the Zoom. You can also get it here in the room via the headsets. Now, let me ask all of you at home who are joining us, I'm sure you know the drill by now, please make sure your microphones are shut off and that your cameras are shut off. Thank you very much for that. On behalf of our organizers today, Monsieur Bernard Fautrier, Minister Plenipotentiary and Special Advisor to His Serene Highness, the Sovereign Prince for Environment, Monsieur Robert Calcagno, CEO of the Oceanographic Institute, uh, Prince Albert I of Monaco Foundation, and Mr. Olivier Wenden, Vice President of the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation. I'd like to warmly thank all of you for being here with us today, whether it's in person or on Zoom. Just a reminder for you of what the program's been like so far this morning. Our session one took a look at how to make sure that synergies are built between the various frameworks and negotiations where the oceans are discussed. Just a moment ago, earlier this afternoon, we heard from some of the actors of the blue economy on how to make sure that this rapidly growing sector develops in a responsible way. And now in our final session, we're going to look at how to finance a sustainable blue economy and how to build back better after the pandemic. The hope is that out of all of these workshops today, we'll be able to articulate a series of key recommendations which can help move things forward at the UN Oceans Conference, for example, the IUCN World Conservation Congress, or the next meeting of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Let's now take a quick look at the program that's coming up for you this afternoon. We're going to have two keynote speeches. Those will be from first, Carlos Eduardo Correa, Minister for the Environment and Sustainable Development in Colombia. And then we will have Jens Frolisch Holt, State Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Norway. After their talks, there will be a 40-minute panel discussion moderated by Sylvie Goulard of the Banque de France. That'll be followed by a 30-minute Q&A where you will have the chance to ask your questions via the chat on Zoom. And to wrap up our day, we'll have some closing remarks from Robert Calcogno and Olivier Wenden. So without further ado, let's bring in Minister Carlos Eduardo Carrera, who joins us from Colombia, very early there. Welcome to you. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Good afternoon to everyone. I would like to greet His Serene Highness, Albert II, Prince of Monaco, and extend him my gratitude, especially for leading this initiative as it allows us to come together to discuss and reflect on many challenges our oceans pose. I would also like to greet the rest of the keynote speakers, panelists, participants, ladies, and gentlemen. It's a great honor to participate in this event, and I would like to start off by sharing with you some facts about Colombia. We are fortunate enough to have Pacific Ocean coastlines and Caribbean coastlines as well. In fact, approximately 46% of our territory is made of, of, of oceans. We rank first in the Americas in extensions, in, in extensions of marine pasture middle and have the second most important coralline barrier reef on the Caribbean. After Brazil and Mexico, Colombia ranks third in mangroves in the Americas. We also have natural wonders such as the Malpelo Island, which His Serene Highness had the honor to visit in March of 2018, as it was declared part of the World Heritage by UNESCO. 
Taking this into account and considering the compromise made with humanity to conserve our ecosystems and the biodiversity we are fortunate to have in the country, Colombia honors her international commitments and we are looking forward to raising the bar high at international negotiations on biodiversity, climate change, and of course, on oceans. We recently updated our NDC. Colombia compromised uh, is to reduce for 2030 in 51% the greenhouse gases emissions. But also we are looking in having a strong carbon market and in moving into the transition to a carbon neutral economy for 2050. When IT goals were set and agreed, Colombia was present as a double coastline country. We achieved a 13.8 conservation percentage regarding to our marine and coastline territories, thereby surpassing the 2020 commitment percentage, which was 10% as provided by H -E goal number 11, protected areas represent an extension of 12.8 million hectares, a surface uh, almost the size of Greece. Colombia also increased times 10 coverage of protected marine areas between 2010 and 2020. This alone constitutes a titanic achievement for the country and the world. At post-2020 global biodiversity framework negotiations, we will determine new objectives and will set global goals for the next decades. In this sense, uh, we will become host of uh, what we can call the pre cop of the Biodiversity Convention. Colombia is also a member of the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, presided both by Costa Rica and France. As part of the coalition, we are committed with a 30% conservation of global marine and land ecosystems by 2030. And as we have made progress on climate change, it is time for the financial sector to set goals looking to either revert or stop loss of biodiversity. As we must always remember that biodiversity is closely related to climate change. To invest in natural capital will not only generate positive impacts on biodiversity, it will also allow us to avoid economic risk as most of the economic sectors depend greatly on the biodiversity or many services provided by the ecosystems. I hereby invite you all this Wednesday, March 24th at 2 p.m. in Monaco to an event we'll be hosting in the Monaco Ocean Week. This will become an opportunity to share with you personally some of our successful experience in Colombia and what we have been doing to embrace the many challenges our oceans pose. We will share our progress in regard to protected areas and to restoration and conservation of marine and coastal ecosystem after a natural disaster, Iota Hurricane, as well as the first blue carbon project at Cispata in San Antero, Department of Cordoba for the sustainable use of mangroves, which is well on its way to obtaining the highest certification there is in the field, verified carbon standard, VERDA. We look forward to continuing to support the, the fight against climate change, as well as the protection and conservation of land and oceans in Colombia, in Monaco, and the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Minister Correa, for providing such insightful insights. Uh, thank you as well uh, for your event that's coming up on Wednesday at 2 p.m. And as the minister said, it is time for the financial sector to set goals looking to either revert or stop the loss of biodiversity. We're going to, of course, stay on that theme now with our second keynote speech. This will be from State Secretary of Norway, Jens Frolisch Holte. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Your uh, Serene Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco, Minister Correa, Second Deputy Director of Banque de France, uh, Sylvie Goudard, Excellencies, colleagues and friends. I'm honoured to address you on this very important topic. But before I start, I would like to acknowledge the invaluable role of our host, His Serene Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco. And I would like to thank him personally for um, his leadership on ocean issues. I particularly note his role as patron for the Ocean Decade Alliance, together with, among uh, others, um, my Prime Minister, Erna Solberg, um, and also the President of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta. The ocean economy uh, has been the cornerstone for Norway, uh, basically forever. We have uh, salt water running in our veins, uh, my hometown of Bergen on the west coast of Norway was founded on the trade of cod and, and stockfish. But the ocean economy is also a cornerstone for the global economy, providing millions of jobs and livelihoods, powering global trade and supplying food for over 3 billion uh, people. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, forecasts estimated that the ocean economy would create uh, 3 trillion US dollars annually in gross value added by 2030. But the mounting pressures on the oceans are jeopardizing the health of marine ecosystems as well as its potential as an economic engine. And this will pose new risks for the financial sector. On the other hand, it is clear that uh, investments in a sustainable ocean economy uh, represent excellent business opportunities uh, we are talking about solutions such as um, offshore wind, uh, sustainable ocean-based food production, uh, decarbonization in international uh, shipping, uh, and also conservation and restoration of mangroves. All these activities um, are estimated to yield a benefit to cost ratio of more than five to one. So for society as a whole, um, these investments are extremely valuable. By channeling capital to such activities, financial markets can play a critical transition to a more sustainable blue economy. Increasingly, um, investors and lenders acknowledge that climate and environmental risk could impact their returns, and investors also start to account for such risk in their investment and lending decisions. And you know, investors care uh, quite a lot about their risk and returns, so this is a very good thing. And we have also seen record inflows into um, funds and, um, and stocks and financial instruments um, that are green uh, or sustainable. So the, there is a great moment to capitalize on this um, and for us to channel more money into the blue economy. But still we have a long way to go. Uh, for the past 10 years, uh, investment in sustainable projects via philanthropy or um, development assistance have only amounted to 1% of the ocean's total value. So the level of finance does not match the level of urgency uh, that we see on the other hand. Significantly increased financial flows are needed towards projects that support a transition into a more sustainable uh, ocean economy. And we need also to direct existing financial flows in the right direction. When we are building back um, after uh, COVID-19, we could choose to go back to the old part of, uh, of high emissions, uh, of uh, inequality, of brown growth, or we could choose and invest in areas that are um, green and blue, that uh, provide equality for everyone. Now we're talking about uh, um, aquaculture, mariculture, uh, we're talking about waste management, um, activities in renewable energy, that will create uh, well-paying jobs for um, many people in the aftermath of COVID-19. The lack of political will is one of the biggest barriers to this strategy. But this is changing. 
Uh, in December, uh, the high-level panel on the sustainable ocean economy uh, presented their conclusions and recommendations. This panel was put together by, uh, by 14 heads of state and government, uh, co-chaired by Norwegian Prime Minister Erna Solberg. And these sets of recommendations really point out the direction uh, for a sustainable ocean economy, and, with, and they have specific recommendations on finance. Uh, members of the ocean panel are already acting on these commitments. Uh, Portugal has uh, um, endorsed the sustainable blue economy financing principles, and both Norway and Canada has committed funds to the World Bank's Pro Blue uh, Fund to help development of sustainable ocean plants uh, in uh, blue economy strategies. So there are some movements there, um, uh, but significantly more finance is needed to achieve a sustainable uh, ocean economy. And we need also to remember uh, my final point here, that the financial markets are not something remote or opaque or something that's distant. The financial market, it consists, consists of all of us, of you and me. It's our pension money, uh, it's our savings. Uh, it's uh, also our government's uh, reserves that are out there making up the financial markets. So we have, we have every right to demand uh, investments in, in, in greener and bluer, um, bluer ways. Um, and I think we have a great moment of opportunity now uh, with the high-level panel on the sustainable ocean economy having come out with recommendations. And I strongly recommend all of you to read them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you, Jens. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Jens Frolis Holte. So more finance, of course, required if we are to achieve a sustainable ocean economy. But how do you make that financing happen? What role exactly does the financial sector need to play in managing risks related to biodiversity loss and financing the sustainable blue economy? Well, we might come up with an answer today thanks to our next outstanding group of speakers. The moderator for this session on financing the blue economy is Sylvie Goulard, who's here with me now, second deputy governor of the Banque de France. Sylvie, thank you so much for accepting this task. Thank you. <laughs> now, I want first of all to thank uh, His Serene Highness and, and Roberto Calcagno and the Fondation and all the people here present, n not too many, but much more uh, on the screen for, for organizing or participating. Uh, now, it's, it's a very nice topic. Uh, in the Banque de France, we have uh, dealt with climate change um, in, in the last years, but not specifically on, on blue. So I'm here to learn a lot. And it's great because I, we have um, specialists of, uh, of several uh, aspects from the private sector, from NGOs. You are supposed to present them. Oh, okay, yeah. so I leave it to you. No, no, no worries at all. Let me just jump in and tell you who else is going to be with us on the panel. So as Sylvie said, people from many different domains. We will have Dr. David Myers, who's the chief executive of the Conservation Finance Alliance. Also with us, Klaas De Vos, an Edinburgh Ocean Leader, consultant at Ocean Fox Advisory. Chip Cunliffe, Director of Sustainable Development, AXA XL. Pierre Rousseau, Senior Strategic Advisor for Sustainable Business, Group BNP Paribas, and Damien Payetakis, who's the Head of Sustainable and Impact Investing at Barclays Private Bank. Welcome to you all. We should see you now appearing on the screen. Are you there? Where are our panelists? Sylvia, it might just be you and me. Oh, there they are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to you all. Just before I, I give Sylvia the floor, just to remind again all of our participants, you can ask your questions of the panelists. So feel free to send in those questions on the chat during the discussion, and we'll get to them in about 40 minutes' time. Sylvia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all to the panelists to be there with us. Uh, well, we have heard several times today, several times today, that we need more money, that we need to invest more. So here we are. Finance can provide actually uh, two different things. The first one is to evaluate risks because this is something uh, the finance knows, uh, and and also provide the financing, helping to scale it up. Uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, we have been. Um, running a, a net, we have we created a network of central banks and supervisors uh, three years ago. Now, La Principauté de Monaco is also uh, one of the member. 
The last one entering uh, was the Federal Reserve of the United States in December. We are very happy to have the US. We are more than 90 uh, countries. It's a technical body. We just try to develop the tools and encourage the private sector and uh, other organizations to exchange. Because we have to confess, we should be very humble. We don't always have the data, we don't always have the metrics. And that's the reason why the first question I would like to ask uh, to our panelists is about how much blue you have in the green or how much green you have in the blue, which is, is there a specificity of blue finance or is more or less the reasoning we adopt for greening in general uh, the good answer. So if you allow me, I would like to give the floor first to Klaas de Vos to tell us what he thinks about it. Klaas, you have the floor. I remind you all that you are supposed to be relatively brief because we'll have two rounds of questions and I would like to take some of the questions of, of the people uh, listening to us. Thank you, Klaas. Thank you very much, Sylvie, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Bonjour à tous à Monaco. Um, I'll dive straight into the point um, around this question of the specificities between uh, blue and green, uh, and I'll do that over three very brief points. And the first one for me is really that uh, ultimately blue and green are moving in the same direction. They are part of the same overall set of goals for sustainability. And to me, they both form an essential component of the planetary economy. So whether you're talking about the blue economy or the green economy, they are moving in the same direction and they have very similar objectives. That said, there are some distinctions with respect to the blue economy that warrant more focus and that warrant more attention from not only financial institutions, but a lot of different kinds of stakeholders. Uh, I won't go into the specifics of the facts and figures that we've heard before related to environmental and social impact in the ocean, but suffice to say that there are challenges related to governance that relate to data, that relate to tenure, that are different from the ones that we see in a terrestrial context and in a green context. And what I think this means, particularly for financial institutions, is that there's a need to better understand what these challenges look like within the blue economy, where those risks lie, how those risks are material to their businesses, to their investments, um, and equally understand what that means in terms of what best practice looks like and where the, uh, the opportunities lie within the blue economy. And so, for me, the important element to consider here is the emergence of some new frameworks that are really helping to articulate what that looks like. We've seen a lot of momentum coming, for example, from the uh, EU taxonomy work on sustainable investment. We've seen a lot of interest in the emerging framework on the task force for nature-related financial disclosures. Uh, but equally, and something that I had the pleasure to work on over the past eight months, we saw the UN's Environment Programs Finance Initiative release Sustainable Blue Economy Financing Guidance. And this guidance really sets out to build a very clear narrative between the sectors of the blue economy to identify what pressures they exert on environment and society, what pressures... Um, translate into by way of impact, and then for financial institutions, crucially thinking what risks those impacts represent and how those risks are material to them as entities, as institutions, and then offering specific recommendations about what to do about those impacts and how to address that materiality. Um, I'll leave it there. I think I, I would love to see more of this focus on these frameworks that now exist particularly for the financial institutions themselves. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to look at this guidance that's been published and really work to understanding what some of these unique challenges and opportunities are in the blue economy. Um, I would like to move to Chip Cunliffe because we have the chance to have with us someone from the insurance sector where risk analysis is, uh, is uh, there is an asset there. So Chip, can you tell us what is the perspective from, from the insurers? Thank you. Many thanks, Sylvie, and, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, look, I think that um, you know, financial institutions, whether you're insurers or whether you're a bank, um, have a, a fairly, in fact, incredibly important role in terms of leadership 
um, from, a, from the point of view of supporting awareness and decision making around uh, the blue economy and, of course, biodiversity loss as well. Um, I think there's a huge amount of great work in understanding the landscape, but of course, biodiversity loss and, and indeed the, 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 the focus on the ocean is an issue not for tomorrow, but of course for today. Um, and us not investing in nature and not investing in the space, um, we think will uh, could result in significant risk, um, especially when we're talking about it from, a, a, I suppose, from a, uh, an insurance perspective, where we look, where we see nature as a, a critical component of disaster risk management um, and indeed climate adaptation. Uh, I suppose more in the in the vulnerable geographies. Um, we of course need to understand and need to increase our knowledge. Um, that's both from the private sector and the public sector uh, when it comes to the ocean. Um, and I think you know, that the work that Glass um, has done, the work that WWF uh, continue to do, the Friends of Ocean Action, the OECD and, and others, hugely important um, in understanding the space. Um, and indeed we at AXA um, uh, did so in 2019 with a, a report in uh, integrating nature in, into our investment strategies. Um, and indeed, one of the outputs of that was you know, the, this idea of the, the TNFD. Um, so, but, but we're also very aware that we need to find a balance between um, you know, the positioning papers and moving the needle today, because ultimately we need the tools to do that um, as soon as possible. Um, and so coming back to your question, I suppose, about sort of the green and the blue, um, from my perspective, I think that you know the green tools that have been developed over the last ten to fifteen years or so, they're now much more mainstreamed. Um, and um, and you know, it's a rhetorical question: is you know, why should we reinvent the wheel? Um, given that you know, the, let's say an example is you know the green bond principles. Um, are we looking to to develop some blue bond principles? Well, unlikely, given the fact that you know. Um, ultimately, the ones that we have now, uh, green, uh, already have traction. So the, 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 the focus on the use of proceeds, the management of those proceeds, the, you know, the process um, for project evaluation and selection and then reporting. I mean, ultimately, we don't need to reinvent that wheel. Um, although we could probably paint it blue. Um, but, you know, I think there's a huge amount of work already, already done. So I, I think that's that's two parts of that that puzzle. And I think that uh, certainly from our perspective at AXA, you know, we are already working to, uh, you know, we've we've already set up a climate and burst biodiversity fund worth 350 million euros. Um, we have an AXA research fund where we're focusing on, you know, biodiversity or a lot of work on biodiversity already. Some of the work that I'm working on um, in the Ocean Risk Initiative, focusing on, you know, development of a mangrove insurance product. Um, and then, you know, the, the work that, uh, that I'm helping to develop through the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance um, in driving investment into nature um, is hugely important too. So I think there's, lastly, there's that really important piece about understanding that the, uh, uh, the, where we sit currently, but also driving this, um, this all along uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chip. Yes, a lot of work has been done, was done already, and I think we should not reinvent the reels, as you said. And uh, the, the Ocean Risk Initiative is a very interesting one for the people who would like to have a, to have a look. Um, if I may, I would like now to give the floor to David uh, Myers, uh, who is the chief executive of uh, the Conservation Finance Alliance. How do you see uh, these? question of blue including biodiversity has cheap said oh, thank you very much sylvie um just um you know from from my perspective um there's uh so many different issues at, at play here and um and the oceans like a lot of uh, ec natural ecosystems on the land um have certain uh, characteristics that, that need to be taken into consideration when we're thinking about how do we scale private sector investment and some of these were alluded to before um, you know for example uh, there's a lot of open access situations these are you know for the most part a lot of the resources in the oceans are, are you know public uh, goods that need to be um, managed through through the right governance and institutional uh, network so um, for the you know private sector response to incentives and um, unless we address some of these underlying conditions that 
um, make it difficult to turn economic value into financial value, um, there's going to be a limit to, to the private sector investments. There's a range of private investments that, that have you know, great private returns um, that um, can be used and, and, and um, scaled up in the ocean environment. Um, but there's a whole range of investments that, that really without the, the right government regulations and incentives behind them uh, won't have the right uh, reward to risk ratio um, that will incentivize the private sector to really scale up that investment. And um, so it's really important to think from a holistic point of view, in my opinion, to get the scale that we that we want. And um, I just want to, to um, you know, point out a, a very a practical example of the, the work we're doing with uh, the partners of the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. Um, there's a session tomorrow afternoon, I believe at 5.30 on the Global Fund um, in Monaco Ocean Week. So please uh, see that. But so the, the Global Fund, and you'll, you'll hear a bit more from hopefully from Pierre Russo, uh, one of the private partners of the fund. It is, it's a multi-party um, emerging markets blended finance fund. And it seeks to address some of these issues focusing on on coral reefs and trying to uh, to keep those coral reefs alive, the uh, the fund focuses uh, on on target. It targets resilient reefs for the most part, uh, looking at those direct drivers of degradation. We all know that that you know greenhouse gases and climate change pose uh, existential risks to reefs, and and they're just so important that we um, you know decided to to uh, to try to to leverage as much private sector finance that we could, could bring to the table um, to complement the, the public and philanthropic funding. So the fund will allow a, a range of different tools, um, such as um, you know, blending grants and concessional loans and guarantees with the more direct impact investing from, from the, the private fund. And, um, you know, but still uh, we're looking through this pipeline and trying to figure out um, you know, where there are great investments and, um, there's definitely huge opportunities um, for, you know, and, and taking new approaches to MPAs and things like that. And a lot of the approaches do come from the, the work that's been done on land, um, but they just have to be uh, slightly uh, interpreted. For example, um, on, on land, there's um, there's protected areas that have been, you know, public-private partnerships that where um, an NGO will manage a, a park and, and invest heavily in it and pay themselves back and pay back uh, potential loans um, through, uh, through ecotourism. In the oceans, um, it's more of a shared resources. You have to involve the communities more. Um, and I'm talking near shore issues. When you get to open water issues, it gets even more complicated and, and you need basically strong international agreements to create the right incentives to, uh, to get some of these finance mechanisms to, to work. And so I know we have time, so um, I'm gonna stop there, but um, really great opportunities and um, but a great challenge as well. Now, thank you, David, for underlying the, the specificities, but also the connections, for example, between climate change and, and coral reefs and, and their evolution. As you, as you gave yourself the floor to Pierre Rousseau, I think maybe I will give the floor Pierre first, and then Damien, if you don't mind, to make it more lively. Pierre, do you want to, to say a word on, on this initiative you co-finance? You are from BNP Paribas. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so, um, yes, we, I can talk about this initiative, but uh, I will start by talking about your first question, which is about the green and the blue. And I will say that don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, I think we have done a lot of work there, and that's probably uh, what the way to do. The second thing, keep in mind that 80% uh, of the, pop the pollution of the ocean is coming from Earth. And the connection that we will have between the landscape and the ecosystem, marine ecosystem, is there. Is there there in terms of risk like pollution, but is there also in terms of opportunities? So this, today we, we learn about the seaweed and the opportunity of the seaweed. We can say that developing the seaweed, which is zero deforestation, which is without uh, water problems, uh, without destruction of soil, which is not using chemical fertilizer, etc., is a way to provide a protein at a, at a better scale than doing it on land. So there is maybe something to think on the large scale there too. So we see the interaction between the two. But this being said, everything around marine and ocean is more complex. First, because the, the, the lack of knowledge today by the scientists, you know, this is where, this is where the, the ocean is probably the things that we don't know very well. The scientists, but also the, the corporate. Uh, the, this afternoon, the, the BCG person mentioned that this is the, the ocean. Nobody cares about it. And the ocean is the problem of everybody. 
And so this is why we like this initiative here that we mentioned about the coral reef. The coral reef, it's, it's unique. Why? Because we don't start from an economical point of view. We start from a conservation point of view, which is to safeguard and keep the resilient corals. And in order to do that, we will not rely only on donation, on, uh, on grants, even we need them in order to play a role of catalytic, in order to launch, and I will explain why. But the purpose is to incubate profitable projects. And we, if we need to come profitability, it's profitability first in order to pay and to make the resilience the conservation, because then the conservation will create opportunities but the opportunities will create activities and activities will serve also to pay the conservation. So you create, you create a virtual circle there. The second thing is that you provide decent jobs and decent opportunities for the local population. Okay, so they can sustain by themselves. And third, you can pay an investor. So that's the purpose of the, the tree. So we need to we need to bring that and we need to, and if we want to bring that, we need to give it to to, to countries who have good ideas and who, have, who are bringing some, uh, some excellent, uh, excellent project, but also to small entrepreneurs. And so we can give the opportunity for small entrepreneurs to come with their skills and innovation and their passion also for that. So we can give them the means to do that. And last but not least, it's also to bring the corporates, the large corporates who have decided to integrate into the business model uh, the, the, the conservation. And there are some corporates doing that and they are thinking because they knew that in the future, this will be part of the business proposition. And we need to create trust and transparency. In that kind of project, what is complex is the collaboration between the people. So we need to align different people with different view. We need also to bring them together. But the real challenge, and that maybe we can talk about it later when we, we, we have a later question, it's really the fact that we have to bring together different source of funding between public, philanthropic, and private, which all run with different rules. And so in terms, instead of integrating those rules, what we do, we pile them up. So we pile them up. So we need to take all the burden of every of them in order to solve the problem. And this is where the complication is. And this is where probably there is some work to do in order to create platform who will promote those blended finance. Thank you, Pierre. And um, thank you, Fabian, for being so pa patient. So our last speakers, but not least, comes from, from Brackless. And I think very interesting the point you made on profitability. The idea is actually to make investment in nature profitable and to generate uh, earnings and, and, and positive flows and, of course, to combine with public action or, or, or charity. Fabian, how do you see it from uh, the Barclays perspective? Absolutely, and, and thank you very much. So where, where I sit within Barclays Private Bank, uh, working with individuals and families and family offices around the topic, I think it's very interesting to see from a more general investor perspective where we've often talked in the last 12 or 24 months about the David Attenborough effect, that the ocean economy has not necessarily received the attention that it deserves on a financial basis, even as from a more zeitgeist perspective, we can see more and more the importance of it. And I think what I see, in, if I think about both from my own business and also the wider Barclays business, is not a lack of willingness, but oftentimes a financial system that doesn't have the same awareness and understanding of the ocean economy as has been developed in the green space. And it's interesting, in 2020, Responsible Investor did some research around institutional investors and highlighted three main issues that came out. One was a lack of investment-grade opportunities in firms at scale in which to put capital into. The second is not enough internal expertise. And the last is a lack of definition around this topic. Now, on those three topics, I would certainly hope what Klaus has referred to in terms of the lack of definition is, is starting to be solved with the, that UNFI and with those sustainable, uh, the sustainable ocean economy principles that have been founded. But we still remain with those two other issues, certainly for financial institutions uh, and certainly for private capital that would like to get involved. You know, clearly there is more need for internal expertise around the topics. And I would also argue a bridge between what is often a very robust and systematic scientific community and economic policy community to what is investable for investors and where private capital can flow. 
And secondly, there's investment grade opportunities in firms at scale. And Pierre is absolutely right. We need more blended finance opportunities to start with. But we also need more of those capital opportunities that are both small for companies that can scale up, but even more over those larger scale opportunities for companies that should be accounted for. Now, rather than simply admire the problem, I would say that we have three options from an ocean economy perspective to consider. One is to maintain a separation between blue and green. In that way, you, you do have a niche and a focus of people who are truly passionate about this and the recognition of the importance of the ocean economy and trying to provide capital to help to deliver both the conservation and the growth opportunities around it. The second option is to come beneath, let's say, one of the, either the green finance effort or now the growing biodiversity efforts around and be able to show the linkages between those two and sort of follow behind the stream that is clearly a strong momentum behind those activities. And the last option is to establish more of a symbiotic relationship where in, in reality, the blue economy takes its rightful place in terms of role and scale and influence on the global economy. Now, each of these has advantages and disadvantages, and I've set them out probably less, uh, more mutually exclusively than they have to be. But what I would say is fundamentally there are options across all of those. And where we think about how do we scale and bring more finance into it, I think it's important for us as financial professionals to recognize a little bit, as David or Chip has also said, in terms of the risks for the, the natural capital aspects of it, for the companies that we're looking at financing or investing into, as well as how they uh, align to the wider sustainability opportunities. But then the other side of it, where there are financial opportunities to engage and actually to get exposure to this growth sector and helping people to recognize what that is, both for the financial value of it, but also to make a positive contribution to our world. No, thank you very much, Fabian. A very important point, and as we are at the museum uh, here, uh, I, I want to stress that the need for what you call scientific expertise is, is very high. Once again, the, the basis of all our work, our data, we need to know what we are talking about, we need to evaluate properly, so that's the reason why this kind of, of cooperation is very fruitful. So, what, what, out of this first round, I would say we have heard several times we should not reinvent the wheel. We should uh, use the synergies between what is green in general and what is more specifically blue. But you all agree that there are also elements uh, that remain very specific, uh, linked to the nature of uh, of the oceans compared to the Earth, but also all the legal aspects, the fact that it's not a territory exactly as the rest. So now I suggest that we move to where we are in, in the public discussion. Uh, because of the, the COVID crisis, in quite all parts of the world, uh, we see huge uh, investment programs or at least huge budgetary support coming from the public authorities and we also see uh, great support from the central banks. Uh, and, and all this money uh, should be used, of course, to, uh, to, build, uh, to rebuild better. And many people say, well, let's have a green recovery. So I suggest that we look at what a blue recovery could look like. Maybe I would like um, to ask Chip uh, if um, the, um, the amount of the flows of money now available, how can we make sure that they are going to, uh, to be flagged in the direction of the good projects? How can we make sure that the existing scientific analysis, the financial analysis that they match, that we, we don't lose uh, big challenges in this movement? Chip. Thank you. Um, look, I think it's a... Uh it's it's hugely important. Well, I think there are there are a couple of examples that um, that uh, the panel have have highlighted in terms of uh, the maybe some of the the um, the barriers to investment. Um, and I think Damien's right. You know, you, you're needing both the, the small scale, but also the large scale as well. Or at least that the, the scale that's needed at the, the the many millions of or hundreds of millions of dollars, rather than the, the you know the uh, the tens. Um, and I think from, from our perspective, um, certainly from an insurer uh, perspective, you know, there is this insufficient data to be able to provide us the information that we require to be able to uh, unlock the finance to fund um, the protection of, of natural capital in, in one instance, um, but others, other sort of elements of the blue economy um, as well. Um, and so I think that there's a real need 
um, to, to, well, to, 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 to try and answer that question. And, and so some of the work that we're doing um, through Aura, so the alliance that, uh, that I'm helping to, to work on or work with, is really about how you drive that, you know, that investment, uh, investment into that space. Um, and that's partly down to the fact that we have to work together. We cannot do this individually. You can't do it, as, as Pierre says, you know, it has to be blended, blended finance. But of course, you need to be working across all of those different uh, entities as well, you know, through the public and private, um, uh, you know, public private partnerships uh, al alongside um, the, uh, the philanthropic um, side as well. So Aura itself is very much about, you know, driving and bringing together all of those different parties um, where we can incubate it and finance um, some of those solutions. Um, and we're already starting to do that. Um, and I think it's really critical that we, we do actually have uh, projects that can be uh, driven forward. So we're working on the development of a coastal risk index, integrating for the first time uh, marine ecosystems uh, into our risk models, uh, which will better so we better have a better understanding of um, the the uh, the importance of uh, where investments could flow. Indeed, the, the use of uh, insurance uh, mechanisms as well. But there's also some work going on on on, uh, on developing a coastal resilience bond. Again, you know, creating a value out of uh, some of those marine ecosystems or coastal ecosystems like mangroves and reefs, uh, and. And the protective nature of those um, are providing uh, value to, you know, the, the the assets on land, whether that's a whether that's a hotel, whether that's a, a piece of infrastructure, or indeed a community itself. Um, of course, there's also the focus on blue carbon, um, but all of this has to be based in scientific understanding, um, and we must have that scientific understanding for us to be able to move forward. And I think that the scientific and, and the research piece um, is, is critical. And then you align that with the policy and governance side, um, and you're bringing together those from the global north and the global south um, to develop um, policy commitments for action. Um, and I think it's really the action part uh, that is criti critical uh, in this year specifically. Thank you very much. And do you think that we still finance toxic investments? Um, I think... <laughs> That's a, that's a very nice question, Sylvie. Um, Not I mean, only I for you, are, the um, others as well. Huh? We will be. No, no. <laughs> exactly. Look, I mean, I think that um, you know, each each company or organisation has their own focuses. Um, I think that uh, some uh, organisations or some companies are further along the the biodiversity and climate routes than others, um, and uh, you know, I think that that's a really critical piece for all of us. Okay, I'm going back to Damian, and I must apologize because I was told that I called you Fabian, which is also a very nice uh, first name, to be honest. But Damian, what, what is your feeling on, on, on the, the, the way investment is channeled right now? I mean, because in all our societies, above all democracies, the existing activities are represented. They can be heard. Tomorrow's activities, the future-oriented one, they have no lobby to say so, or no representation, and next generation don't vote yet. So do you have an idea of how we can move from the current economy to the one we want to build without losing the people uh, we have to convince? Well, uh, thank you for that. Also a challenging question, and certainly not the worst thing I've ever been called. But. Um, so I, I think the, the, what, what Chip alluded to is really the recognition that not all the externalities that, that we have from the financial activity have thus far or historically been accounted for in relation to the decisions that we make, both as investors or as a financial system. And I think that is partially where the data can help us to provide more certainty and more willingness in order to, as you alluded to at the very beginning, reduce the risks on the decisions that we make from a purely financial materiality perspective. But obviously there's a double materiality here, right? There is the other side of the materiality, which is the effects that the companies and the projects that we invest into have on the world that are not always accounted for. And I think as the data comes out, we are more and more certain about how do we address that. And for those of us who are not you know, part of the next generation, but part of the current or older generations, that is as important in terms of the legacy that we want to leave. 
But I do think it's not simply about data. Um, I will say certainly for many investors that we speak to, the, the clear evidence on a down to a, 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 a molecule or a micron level is not as important as the fundamental principle and the practice of how we decide to operate our financial system. And in some ways, I think we are at a good, but still an early stage of movement in this space. Again, if you think about it, that turning the tide report, these things came out in literally the last month. Right? They came out March of this year in terms of a systemic global set of guidance around it. And it does take time for the financial system to understand, absorb, and apply these things. So uh, I, I think in some ways, the, the vocality of younger generations is hugely important to help to make sure that we are characterizing and, and contemplating and, and thinking about the activity before their voters. But moreover, I think it's the ability to make it feasible and implementable that actually allows the financial system to move much more rapidly into these spaces. The more we can bridge across to how the system works, arguing we can argue about the effectiveness of the system itself separately, but the more we can bridge across to how the financial system works today, to put it in the language that it understands from a materiality or a risk or a return perspective, I think the more likely we are to see the ocean economy becoming more and more valuable and more and more investable and more and more capital flowing into it. Thank you, Damien. <laughs> David, what do you think about this making it profitable, making it valuable, and maybe with the pressure from the young generation, we should not forget even if in this crisis we hear them a little bit less than before? David. Thank you, Sylvie. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the, um, you know, my, my assessment is that when you look at the issue of, you know, all, all these ocean issues and, and, and blue economy issues, they make such sense from an economic point of view. It's it's obvious. In other words, you know, it feeds billions of people. It, uh, you know, it's it's the livelihoods for so many people. Um, but it's converting that that economic value into financial value, which has been the real challenge. And so, you know, as we stated before, you know, there's all these externalities which are not, you know, accounted for either in government accounting, like we're focused on GDP growth, things like that. Um, but in the private sector, um, you know. Externalities, a company that, that tries to incorporate them is basically penalized. So you, we do need um, to figure out ways, and there are so many different approaches that, that can you know, internalize these externalities. And um, government, as I mentioned, plays such a huge role. Um, but um, another, another point I wanted to make is that um, there's an issue of scale here, which is a, a big disconnect from, um, you know, traditional investing to um, action on the ground. In, in the Global Fund for Coral, <clears throat> for Coral Reefs, we're looking at the direct drivers of degradation. And these are all, a lot of them are occurring at, at you know, small scale, unsustainable fisheries, you know, um, and uh, the, the, all the a lot of the opportunities are at small scale and the, um, you know, sort of investment community wants fewer transactions at a larger scale. And um, it's really hard to, to build that a pipeline of deals that would satisfy the investment industry um, because they want larger deals. It, it's, it's a, you know, by the time you spend a, doing a deal, um, it's much easier to do a $10 million deal than a $10,000 deal. That doesn't really help you. So we're looking to, to, to work with a, a range of intermediaries to solve this problem. But, um, but scale is, is such a great barrier because there are so many great um, positive return opportunities at a small scale that just are not getting access to the financing that, that um, is necessary to scale them up and to have the impacts either on coral reefs or other parts of the blue economy that, that is necessary. No, thank you, David. Your point of scale is, is key. I wanted, nevertheless, to come back to the, the idea of externalities and how you internalize them. Because when we are talking about climate, it's not easy, but at least we have, for example, the CO2 tone, and we could dream that one day we price properly the emission of one ton, and it's everywhere the same. How do you proceed with biodiversity to make sure that you internalize properly the costs of uh, the destruction of, of biodiversity? Yeah, that, that is such a great question. It's so easy when um, your metric is one ton. Um, you know, uh, for, for nature, it's, it's infinitely complex. Um, there's been a lot of initiatives right now to try to 
include that measure, uh, you know, include different measures and try to standardize based on uh, species diversity, things like that. I mean, as we recognize, you know, coral reefs, uh, you know, less than 1% of the ocean harbor 25% of the uh, biodiversity, you know, so how do you capture that in terms of impact measurements? And, um, you know, we, we have to use proxies for the most part, um, uh, where you could look at area conserved or, um, you know, but in, in some cases, it, it, you have to re rely ultimately on, on the data and, and look at, you know, fish biomass, things like that. We've, you know, when I say that economics are clear, when it's been shown that if you have a, a you know, 25% uh, no take zone in a certain area, um, you're increasing fish biomass and the size of the fish that are harvested outside of it. So, um, but how do you monetize that, right? So you're, you're, you're saying, don't touch this area, um, it'll be good for you. We need transition finance for those communities to, to wait it out. We need, um, you know, the, the outside uh, potential uh, fishers to recognize that this is not an area they can come into. These are very detailed, complicated things, but ultimately when you do measure biomass or species diversity, a lot of these initiatives are, are proving to be valuable, but it's, it, you need, it, it's, how do you incorporate the cost of that science into your investments? That's a, also a challenge. You know, you, we we don't want to place additional burdens on private sector companies um, to not only take a higher risk, let's say, per return, but also then to take some of that private money and invest it in um, in research. Um, so we got to we have to come up with with simpler uh, mechanisms, simpler ways to to measure the impact. But for the most part, um, it, it can be done through sort of intermediate proxies. Areas conserved, uh, you know, size of fish is a great measure, for example, things like that. Thank you, David. As you mentioned, the private sector perspective, I would like to give the floor to Pierre. How do you feel this? Do you have the feeling it's feasible, it's within reach to, to, to make profitability, if I, to, to, to quantify what could make conservation profitable? Yes. Yes, I'm extremely comfortable because at the end, uh, like the com European Commission has said today, is common sense of business. So uh, at the end, common sense of business will make the will put the people in the right direction. Uh, I think we mentioned scientific, scientific. So integrate the scientific is one. We mentioned scale, which is another very important. Uh, I want to mention a third things which are very important, which has been already mentioned in the previous uh, panel is innovation. And innovation is the technology, and everybody has innovation as a technology in mind, but it's also the, it's also the financial innovation. Uh, bankers will believe that uh, we are probably the only sector who will not be uh, transformed by the innovation that is transforming every other sector. I think, uh, unfortunately, we will have to innovate ourselves also. And this is what's happening, and uh, we need to get out from the comfort of uh, probably uh, where we have to where we have to operate our existing business today, why? Because ocean will bring two things: green field, we, a lot of new things. So the green field doesn't the investor doesn't like the green field. So so this is where scientists normally we need to listen to them and we need to make sure that we do understand and we transform the scientific world into investment. So we need to create a narrative. So narrative is very important. The second thing is, uh, is, uh, is try to also to understand what we need to finance. And in order to, to dare risk, we have catalytic. So we can use the money from the philanthropists, from the public sector, in order to do the finance, the transition. Some transition are quite easy to, to finance, like the offshore business, uh, like, the, uh, like uh, it happened easily. And it, because you create something new, the people understand it was, it was uh, infrastructure and the people can go on that easily. And it happens. And um, it, even the shipping today is starting to be complicated because we do realize that uh, uh, we have made a green bonds recently. Oh, we call it green, by the way, for a shipping company. Uh, and, um, and we did a green bonds, but we do realize that uh, doing green bonds and green loans will be more and more difficult because uh, regulation of Basel IV is creating more pressure on the cost of capital. So that means we will have probably to attract much more investor in order to finance the transformation of the shipping business. So what we do realize is that what is important is to focus on financing the transition, financing the transformation, financing the green field. This is where we have to and reinsure, the, reinsure the, the, the investor that if we do that, they will, they will, their risk will be reduced and they, are, they can move to an opportunity which will be bigger than before. 
And for that, it means that the investor need also to listen. They need also to, un to, to make the effort to get out from the day-to-day -day rules and regulation uh, in order to, and the way to investment, to reconsider the investment policy, to relook at the opportunity uh, differently. And then we will, we will attract, uh, we will attract uh, investors. Integrating, uh, 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 integrating uh, the uh, externalities is definitely, it will be a long way, but uh, we will come to it because science will help us to do that. We will measure the biomass, we will measure the effect on the cost, we will affect the, the different uh, aspect. There are more and more studies which are helping us to do that. I want to mention recently there is the mangrove a study which has been made, uh, uh, or do we do an asset on mangrove by uh, Heart Securities, which was pretty good. It will explain all the benefit and try to quantify it. After that, what we need is to be innovative in finance in order to bring solution and solution that will incorporate what investors are doing because it's greenfield, financing is doing because it's also on the long term. So in asset managers and um, banks need to work closer together and even insurance because when we are talking on blue we are we are and we have discussion together uh, with uh, with uh, with my friend uh, Cliff uh, Cliff Chip here on um, on the way that we can also protect uh, what we are investing in so the protection because uh, we are everything which is about blue economy is about uh, high risk in climate uh, higher risk in climate so we need also to incorporate that in the way that we are building solution so thank we're moving from product to solution yeah no thank you pierre now maybe one footnote for the people who are more used to discuss uh, fisheries and oceans than uh, the banking regulations you mentioned the basel four rules. Uh, uh, I don't want to yes. comment on that, but I, I was sure that someone would just for, for all the participants, these are the rules of uh, prudential, for the capital requirements for banks uh, behind, because Basel is not exactly a coastal uh, city and maybe uh, some people would not know. Klaus, you were very, very yeah, patient. <laughs> no, no, point taken. I, I, I know the, the way the bankers complain about that. Uh, Klaus, uh, you were very patient on, on externalities, on scientific um, expertise, on scaling up. What do you, what do you think? It's really a very rich discussion. It's a wonderful discussion, and I think there's a lot of uh, really great alignment on this panel, which is lovely. Um, from my point of view, with respect to, to scaling up and, and thinking about these externalities, um, I think this is a particularly interesting time to have this conversation because to me, the blue economy is at a bit of an inflection point now in terms of how much attention it's getting and how much momentum it's gathering. Uh, and I think there's a natural tendency to, to have a, a distinction between really wanting to define something well and really understand what something means from a sustainability point of view and focusing on uh, what to do and focusing on action. And I feel that we are really entering this point now where we're into an age of implementation and moving beyond this sort of scene setting, framework defining piece and really moving into, okay, how do we do this in practice? What does this mean? And what does this mean particularly because the blue economy isn't one thing, just like biodiversity isn't one thing. What does this mean in the context of investment in shrimp aquaculture in Vietnam versus what does this mean in the context of coastal infrastructure investment through the Belt and Road Initiative? Those are both parts of the blue economy, totally different, have nothing to do with each other. So how do we apply these contexts and these frameworks to these very different types of scenarios? And for me, the part that's really interesting now and something that I haven't heard much uh, talk of uh, until recently is, is granularity and implementation and really taking these conversations and now looking less at the global level at a framework defining point of view and more at a, okay, in this specific region with this specific type of sector, with this specific type of financial institution, what does this mean in practice? What are our targets? How are they time bound? What are the benchmarks? What are the metrics? And then using that information to be able to go off and do the thing, invest in sustainability. And I think there were some really interesting points, um, Pierre in particular, that you raised around some of the challenges around 
getting blended financing off the ground. And there are so many different roles for different types of institutions, different colors of money in this conversation. And to me, it seems that focusing in on this more granular aspect of the implementation question helps to address some of these really big questions around who plays what role, what type of capital is used where under what conditions. And I feel like if we look a little bit more at the more practical granular level, and I'm very heartened here to hear of the things that Chip is doing, to hear what Damien is thinking, in particular hearing some of the things that uh, David has done in the past as well. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done here to take what we now have at this global level and really focus on this age of implementation, that's what I call it, um, and to really try to highlight the opportunities for collaboration across these different stakeholder groups to really help set out what it is that you're trying to accomplish in a specific context, understanding what data you need in a specific context, and then moving forward. No, thank you, Claude. It's a fantastic transition to the question part. Uh, and there was one question on fisheries, and uh, maybe you can take it or, or anyone, do not hesitate to, to say if you want to take the floor. Uh, how can we make sure that the business common sense that was mentioned before does not mean that people are overfishing? How can we make sure that we, we control, we can put conservation before abuse of resources or so fisheries? Who wants to say something? To be a little bit more specific. Klaas. <laughs> I'll just keep talking. Yeah, um, go on. I, to me, what's, what's, interesting, what's interesting here is uh, this question of materiality and really being able to highlight why an institution, regardless of what kind of institution it is, how this affects them from a bottom line point of view. Why is sustainability relevant to you as an institution? And in the case of fisheries, this is a particularly elegant argument because the more biomass there is, the more diverse your ecosystem that supports that biomass, the more productive your fishery, the more you can catch over the long term. I think that is at its most reduced, the core of the argument. There are some complexities there in terms of how you deal with short-termism versus long-term thinking and extracting maximum value now versus uh, a higher maximum, but over an extended period of time uh, that I think uh, requires a degree of engagement and a degree of education on behalf, especially of the NGO community, to be able to help illustrate that narrative and to really help be able to build that understanding through training with these parts of the private sector. Um, but to me, that would be the, the main crux of, of that, that answer, that tension between conservation and business. I think in a lot of instances, being able to highlight that that tension doesn't need to exist. Thank you. There is also a question on capital market. Oh, maybe Pierre, you want to add something on fishes? Yes, I just want to complete what uh, you said by the, 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 coral, the global coral reef fund is just an example of that. So it's really to isolate projects, incubate them in order to teach them that more conservation will lead for more biomass, explaining to the fishermen that they need to go to fish somewhere else or differently, bringing them the, the right tools. And then after that, they will realize that uh, they, will be, they will have more biomass, more fish, and uh, it will be much better. And then after that is to create the ecosystem around that. So instead to go and sell his fish directly, maybe they can process the fish locally. Uh, then we have to install renewables. Then we have also to make sure that uh, if we have electricity, then we can also make sure that uh, uh, they, 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 can, they can have uh, other services around the electricity, which is provided through the renewables, et cetera, et cetera. So, then you create an ecosystem. So you don't think by one single business uniquely, but you think by an ecosystem that you put in place. And then you change completely the economics. And then you have a vision, completely different vision to the economics. And that's probably this exercise that we are doing in the Global Coral Reef Fund will probably be pioneer on that type of things. And we work with NGOs and we work with foundation and we work with scientists. And we are also investing in startup that will help to bring uh, what we call a disruptive solution in order to facilitate uh, this implementation of ecosystem. Thank you. So Sorry, all of you, I, but if well, I can just, okay, Chip, and then there is another uh, question. Just very quickly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just, just quickly. I mean, there's a, there's a project that we're working on with Rare, 
um, through the alliance. Uh, and it sort of links to, to what Pierre was saying in, in terms of uh, integrating microinsurance uh, for small scale fishers in, uh, in um, the Philippines. Um, and uh, you know, the, the introduction of, of insurance as a, um, as, a, as, a, as a lever really to integrate the, uh, that, those local individuals, local communities into a more sort of formalized economy, um, providing that a support that they require um, you know, should um, the, uh, the, their, their, um, their fishing or their, vis their vessels or, or, uh, are damaged by, um, let's say, a, 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 a typhoon. But I'm also aware of the fact that, you know, insurance can be used as a lever to help um, mitigate the imp impacts potentially of IUU fishing as well. Um, and the use of that um, through uh, the, the work that we're doing with Oceania and Ocean United and others as well to, to develop uh, solutions uh, by using insurance to, uh, to, to take, uh, take away the, uh, the opportunities for, um, for vessels that are implicated in IU fishing. Okay, yeah, I, I just want to jump in before we, there's so many questions on the chat, but I just want to make sure, does anyone here in the house have a question for our panel? Anybody? No, there's many questions on the chat. I just want to make sure that we're not excluding this part. <laughs> Good point. Now, there is a question. So the three who have spoken, you don't speak, <laughs> David or, or, or Damien. Uh, do you think capital markets allocate properly resources for the purpose we have in mind now? It's not a yes or no answer, but and how can we improve, of course, the functioning of capital markets to make sure that they can provide the funds? David, first. Great, thank you. Well, I think that there's been um, a great, um, first off, it's a really excellent question and um, one that uh, is, is, is really underlies a lot of the, the challenges we're facing here. And there's a lot of um, effort and it was alluded to before in terms of uh, more clarity with financial disclosure. Um, you know, this, this uh, um, you know, disclosing your impacts on nature, disclosing your dependencies on nature um, is, is a step that will inform investors to a certain extent. But I think it's, it's something that will drive change within organizations, within companies, um, when they recognize how um, dependent they are on nature or how um, their risk and harm to nature is, is influencing potentially their, their reputation and, and their access to, to their capital as well. So, but the... the uh, um, you know, the capital markets are, are not as efficient as one would think. And, um, you know, uh, by integrating these uh, just financial disclosures, and there's a bunch of groups working on it, um, uh, I think that we have a, a, the greatest chance of, of trying to include them in the way that capital markets work. I suppose including natural capital and TNFD type and not only TCFD type. It's what you have in mind. Okay. Damien. Yes. Yeah. So uh, capital markets uh, allocate capital as efficiently as they are structured and the information allows them to do. So which is a very nice way of saying no, they don't to take into account today. But that's also why we're where we are and also why we are where we're headed to go, right? In terms of thinking about all the work that David has just talked about, you think about the things that Klaus and Pierre and others have said here is to recognize that in order to make the capital markets more efficient, we need more and different information and for that information to be taken into account. Now, historically, we've either been agnostic or unaware of the capital or the impact that the capital is that we are putting into the system, oftentimes until well after the effect, uh, effects arise. So it's not a simple question of whether or not they do or don't, but ultimately, to your point, where are we going to? And I think there's three ways fundamentally to change that. One is to, as we've said, internalize the externalities, be it with the data that allows us to make better informed decisions or through governmental expectations or carbon taxes, et cetera, to be able to enforce the financial system to account for these things in a way that it has not had to thus far, even, even where there is desire to do so and obviously challenges to be able to do that. I think secondly, where the reality of it is, you look at economics and the, and the costs come in. And if I use a simple comparison, think about uh, renewable energy, right? Uh, renewable energy and offshore wind, which is now on a levelized cost base, is less expensive to produce energy through renewables than it is through fossil fuel production. 
that is a fundamental shift where it is no longer a moral argument or a passion argument, but fundamentally one that anybody who is thinking about investing has to take into account. And when economic shift, because either, as Pierre has said, you know, we need to get blended finance to show that they're valuable and then scale up to a later extent, but ultimately where we can do that and where the economic shift and that sort of the cost pressure and that cost line goes down, then all of a sudden this no longer becomes simply a, this is the right thing to do, but this is the obvious thing to do from an economic perspective. From a micro actor, as Chip was said, with, 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 uh, with fishermen, or at a macro level for governments as well. So that's the second thing. And third, I think the attractiveness and the attractiveness of these things, because as Pierre had said as well, from an innovation standpoint, from getting more innovative capital and more innovative finance that recognizes the solutions have risks, but also opportunities, that we need to be able to finance these things so that investors and capital feels more confident about investing in them in a new way than it has done before. So uh, ultimately, short answer, no, but we're, I think we're headed in the right direction, very clearly more to do. Thank you for this candid and nevertheless articulated answer. I really believe that when you have the best specialist on an issue of an issue, you cannot you can consider because what you are doing is fantastic but the rest of the market is behind so we should look at what you are doing but not become complacent pierre if i may i would take another question which is an important one on inclusivity you know that in the united nations goals the, the goal number 10 is is uh, to make the society more inclusive how do you see this objective in relation uh, with the, 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 the blue uh, 14 uh, objective. Who is first? And the quick answer, please, because we are... Mo okay, Pierre, fair enough. <laughs> it's, I think, is a very important point. And I will say that uh, as we link climate change uh, with the biodiversity, we need also to include uh, in inclusivity and the local communities is the first part. Uh, you remember when I mentioned on the on the coral reef, and it's one of the key elements that we need to integrate in the profitability system, and it's a way to revisit the value chain. And um, sometimes we forget that if we could manage to solve the uh, the inequalities problem first, maybe we will solve biodiversity issues and climate uh, change issues, especially for the people who are in. Uh, in, in, in terrible condition and living in terrible condition because instead to go to fish immediately, the fish that he has uh, in front of the shore, he will go normally fishing properly uh, a little bit further. And we can see because if the first things he has to care in the, in the morning of his day is uh, to eat or to, uh, to take care of his family, uh, of course, the people will go for the simple way. And I do believe that uh, in every other solution that we are putting in place, it's probably a key element to put, and if not the most important one. And uh, because yes. if we do not create this ecosystem or this landscape, and we do not integrate the proper living for the livelihoods, uh, livelihoods and uh, for the, uh, the local population or the local communities, and even more for the coastal communities, I do believe that it will be not a success. We will not create any resilience. Thank you, thank you, Pierre. No, it was a very important question. I suppose that you could, all of you, have uh, something to say. The very last one, the link you make between what the COVID uh, told us about the vulnerabilities of our societies, maybe what you just said, Pierre, on we would like to tackle inequalities uh, before, or, but we cannot afford to choose which first goal we we tackle because all things are interrelated so how do, would you draw one lesson from uh, from the covid crisis for our topic i mean do you think people will be more aware of uh, the interconnection between nature and human health um, I, I belong myself to a, a commission created by the who europe shared by Mario monti with big economists like Jim O'Neill and, and, and Suma Chakrabati and many other health specialists. And we try to promote the one health concept, which means that uh, you cannot separate human health from uh, environment or, or animal health. Uh, do you think there is some one conclusion to draw from the COVID crisis for the seas and the oceans? David? Yeah, just um, it's something that we're thinking about a lot, and that um, 
if you look at the value that, that nature provides to humanity, which is of course enormous, our air, our food, um, you know, the one thing that is really poorly integrated in, and I think Chip will probably agree, is risk. Um, nature reduces risk to humans in so many different ways. And that, um, that, that service in, in risk reduction, which is exactly what, you know, um, had broke down, if you will, with, with the COVID crisis, um, it's just not valued. It's not, it's not valued or there, there, there are very few mechanisms to capture that value that nature provides. And, and um, so I think that's just a huge issue. And, and that's what, what one of the things that comes up for me. Okay, thank you. Klaas? Uh, just to, to build on, on what David has just set out so beautifully, um, uh, I think uh, it is incumbent upon us as uh, stakeholders who have internalized a lot of this uh, sustainability narrative to keep pushing that narrative forward and to keep reiterating these interlinkages and this interconnectivity between humans and the natural world. Because to me, unfortunately, the reality is that I think a lot of people will not remember that, will not see that. And as and when the, the, the pandemic recedes, will go back to a lot of their status quo thinking and a lot of their status quo behavior. So I think for us, being in a position of privilege where we understand these linkages and we can see them, we have a responsibility to message that at any given opportunity. Thank you, Damien. Just to build on that, if I think about my, my day job working with families again in terms of a private banking perspective, the, the question that I tend to ask in a starting conversation is, if you rewind to December of last year, not this past year, but the year before, and you think about how your portfolio was positioned, if you knew that COVID was going to happen, would you have positioned your portfolio differently? The answer, of course, is yes, we would have invested radically differently than we, than we were positioned come March or April of last year. And I say, well, let's think about that in relation to climate change. Let's think about that in relation to biodiversity. Those are knowns and actually are far more systemic in terms of the scale and size of the impact that it has. So the question is, knowing what we do know about that, how would you like to position your portfolio now? And that all of a sudden opens up to Klaus's point, a very different conversation about how investors, our investors, want to be positioned in relation to those risks and opportunities that they have going forward. Okay, Chip, do you want? Yes, I had the feeling. Chip, yes, you have the floor. Um, you're muted. I knew it happened to me. Um, so, though, I just building on, on everything everyone's really said, but I think, you know, given that um, COP26 at the end of this year, and of course, all the other meetings that will, will happen before it, um, you know, three of the five focuses for the COP are nature-based solutions, finance, and resilience. Um, all of the things that we are talking about today. Um, and although um, COVID, I think, may have shone a light um, on, on th those three things more specifically, um, and will do so into the future, I don't think it's been lost on anybody um, the importance of this um, in the current climate. Um, and indeed, I think it will, it will just continue to grow um, into the consciousness of not only the policymakers, but also hopefully the, the leaders within the private sector uh, and, and across other sectors as well. Because I think that sort of, you know, it, it does need all of us to play, um, to play with this. Um, and uh, it, it's critical that um, if we're able to, to help move that dial, um, that we do so together. Thank you very much. I fear, no, I fear, Pierre, that we are more or less uh, at the end of, of the discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to sum up what you've said because it was really an excellent panel, even if not gender balanced. But okay, we have to admit that men can be excellent as well. Uh, and um, well, I, I just would like to, to take some words I, I will remember. Uh, you have insisted on the holistic approach, the fact that all the phenomena we are dealing with are interconnected. Maybe one word we did not pronounce, but we, which would be important is respect for nature, that we, we consider much more that nature is bringing, is giving us something instead of abusing what is coming from nature. Information and data, which is very important for the financial sector to reallocate the portfolios. 
Um, and uh, well, I would, I would finish with one word, which is hope, because there is a lot of action going on. The COP26 is just uh, uh, before, at the end of the year. Uh, the G20 under the Italian presidency, the summer, the American summer in April. So there are many initiatives, many, maybe too many. We have to make sure that we, we converge. And uh, one thing is sure, we need the NGOs, we need the private sector, we need the finance, but also the corporate. And the question on inclusivity is something we have to keep in mind. We have to take all people on board, all people, the most vulnerable, the most deprived, because it's, um, it's a project for, for mankind as, as a whole. I stop here. For me, it was very rich. I will take a lot. And I hope that next year we meet here, and because I would have had so many questions to ask you at the coffee break. Thank you very much, all the panelists. And thank you for the excellent questions. Thank you to you, Sylvie Goulard. That was wonderful. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you so much to all our panelists as well. And Sylvia, it might not have been gender balanced, but it was woman led. That's important. <laughs> it's, it's already something. All right, well now we are drawing to the very end of this incredible NBI that we could share all of us here together. Just before we go, would you please welcome with me on stage now, Mr. Robert Calcagno, the CEO of the Oceanographic Institute, Prince Albert I of Monaco Foundation, as well as Olivier Wendin, the Vice President and CEO of the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation. They're going to share with us some closing remarks. Gentlemen, please, thank you. Uh, you can take your seats. Thank you, Sylvie, again. Wow. What an incredible hybrid version of the Monaco Blue Initiative. Uh, wow, what a density, what a quality in the exchanges. And it is really now my duty most importantly, my pleasure uh, to thank all the participants, all the, the keynote speaker, and perhaps even more importantly, all the moderators. Uh, thank you, Sébastien Treyer. Thank you, Marie-Pierre Daveux. Thank you, Sylvie Goulard. That was really, really, really good and well done. Uh, let me quote a few words of Isirinaines, the prince, recent words, uh, the ocean is at the earth of all our issues, and it will bring about the progress to which we aspire. And also, earlier today, in John Kerry's word, uh, we cannot fight the climate cri crisis without the power of the ocean. The ocean is a source of sustainable climate solution. What a good and strong works. And we also understand that America is, is back. And maybe a, a proof is that the uh, US government representative, uh, the general consul, Christian Grauer, was here during the full day and the free workshops. Thank you very much for your attendance. Indeed, uh, the ocean is at the earth of the environmental transition. We all want to see, and its preservation is everyone's business. It is a team effort in the interest of every one of us. Uh, the three sessions today have underlined the complementary nature of the players and level of intervention. We need to work with a global ambition that must set the course and remind us of the collective challenge and also, we need to work to the operational commitment of the economic players who will find it in their interest to keep the ocean in good health. It is not always an easy task to combine this global strategy and local operational. During the second and third workshops specifically, we try to understand how to be good and sustainable at the global level, and also how to be profitable and bankable and insurancible at the local level. That's not easy, but I think we, we progressed during our discussion, and that was really, really strong. So it is pleasing to see that progress is being made on the various fronts, that 
a new view is being formed on the protection of the ocean, which is not just a moral and vital obligation, but an opportunity. Analytical tools are being developed for example, for the uh, greening the national, uh, the network for greening the national, uh, uh, f the financial system, sorry. Analytical tools are being developed to assess this opportunity. These are the wheels of the transition that we all want to see. And now, leave me, give me the floor to Olivier Venden from the Prince Albert II Second Foundation for the conclusion. Olivier, please. Thank you very much, Robert. Well, as part of the transition you have just mentioned, we see many contradictory objectives. But they may actually converge if we approach them in a very coordinated manner. We must prevent to oppose health and environment, and we must seek for more holistic and inclusive solutions. As climate, ocean, and biodiversity are indeed different aspects of the same issue as Mr. Kerry quoted this morning. A few days ago, a publication from our friends Enric Sala and Jane Lubchenko, among others, highlighted the fact that marine protected areas may provide a triple win by safeguarding biodiversity, improving marine fisheries, and contributing to carbon sequestration. This multidimensional and multi-level approach might be indeed the right direction to follow. We actually perceive the importance of working together and articulating our agendas, consolidating some existing initiatives, but also and mainly by bridging the gap between science, the public sector, the private sector, and the civil society. Aligning science, policy, and business has been central in the organization of the Monaco Blue Initiative over the editions. It has enabled us to enlarge this think tank to a whole week of events as part of our Ocean Week. And Blue Economy, Blue Finance, as well as Awareness and Innovations will actually be central um, in this week of events to come. I believe they will be in line with quite a few of the main points that were addressed here today. More coherence between public and the private sector, finance being key to leverage, to scale up the solutions. Nature-based solutions as well are important to focus on. And the economic value of our ecosystems. Long-term and sustainable approach to this mix of solutions will be key. And a word that we, we heard this morning that resonates very, um, with great importance, ocean democracy. In other words, to give the voice to the communities that live with the ocean. I hope you will be able to participate and join us in this series of 41 events to come, mainly online, of course. And you will notice that there is no shortage of concrete initiatives when ocean, climate, and biodiversity are at stake. So dear friends, to conclude, despite the difficult context of this lasting pandemic, we appreciate all your efforts and con commitment, and this commitment remaining intact. This is really important today. So on behalf of His Serene Highness, His Foundation, the Oceanographic Institute, we would like to extend our sincere thanks for your tireless commitments for a sustainable management of the ocean. Thank you to our dear speakers, to our master of ceremony, Jeannie. She did an incredible job. Congratulations, Jeannie. To our moderators and panelists. Thank you dearly also to our sponsors, Rolex and Barclays Private Bank. Thank you for the team of the Monaco Blue Initiative, and thank you to all participants. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Ocean Week. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Robert.
All right, we're almost done. Just a few reminders. I want to remind everyone again that all of our sessions today were covered by the IISD, the International Institute for Sustainable Development Reporting Services. They will be available shortly on their website. The recordings of all these sessions will also be available on the MBI website, as well as the traditional MBI summaries. And we are counting on you to spread this message. Don't forget our hashtag. Tweet it out. Send it out on Instagram, MBI2021. As both of these lovely gentlemen were saying, we are in the midst of Monaco Ocean Week, the week completely dedicated to the ocean. Lots of things to do. I just want to draw your attention to one particularly interesting webinar that's organized by the Scientific Center of Monaco that will be focusing on blue sustainable finance and blue-green economy in Africa this Wednesday at 2 p.m. That wraps it up for this event. On behalf of all the organizers and the team, I just want to extend again our sincere thanks to everyone for attending this 12th edition of the MBI. We're really looking forward to seeing everyone here in person, we hope, for the